Good evening. I don't know if you remember last time I was up here, we talked about John chapter 1. Guess what we're going to talk about tonight? That's right! <laughs> John chapter 2, but you know, we're not going to get through it because there's just so much stuff in John chapter 2. So I'm just going to get through the first 16 verses. And y'all are going to have to be just satisfied with that. Because that's all I could study on. Julie can tell you, I was, I was up late last night reading, and I got up early and was reading again. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in here. Um, if you remember back with chapter 1, some of the things we talked about, uh, John talked about the fact that, <clears throat> that he had known Jesus personally that he had touched him, he had seen him. You know, he gave that testimony. And then he talked about the fact that God, Jesus, he, he, he lives in the light. Uh, in fact, there in, uh, what is that, verse 5, he says, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And the idea there was is, is God can't have anything to do with sin. That's kind of the idea there. And he talked about, you know, the fact that we're all sinners. And then he kind of expounds upon this in, chap in chapter 2. The first two verses really kind of continue some of the thoughts that he talked about in chapter 1. So I'm going to just read the first two verses, and we'll talk about that. He says, My little children, he said, These things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. First thing that uh, I like in here is where he, he says, my little children. Now, he, he uses that as like an affectionate term, you know, towards the people he's writing to. Later on, he uses it a different way. So in, in this verse, he's using it like as a, uh, as a way to show affection towards those he's writing to. Later on, he uses it to denote those who are young in the faith. So how do how would we know that something was like used that way? How would we know how to tell how a word's used? Oh, from, context. from its context, right? <laughs> yeah, that's just a basic Bible thing, and 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 I love it like when the news when they'll like quote some politician. And everybody goes, oh, no, I can't believe so-and-so said that. And then you read the whole quote, and you're like, oh, he didn't say that at all. <laughs> you know, they only just picked out a little part of what he said. So that kind of happens. People do that with the Bible all the time. They'll come up with a, uh, they'll come up with a whole uh, doctrine based on some verse, and they took it out of its context. And I think, like, uh, the, the doctrine of faith alone is one of those. He says, my little children, says, these things I write to you that so you may not sin. And uh, it's good that he's given us some instructions on how to keep from sin. And <clears throat> it's one thing to have instructions, and it's another thing to put them into practice, right? I had this uncle, I, Julie, I've never told Julie this story. I, I had this uncle when I was a kid. And we would go over to my grandma's for like, you know, a, a dinner or something. And uh, this uncle was a real know-it-all. And my dad might say, oh, yeah, well, today we were whatever. We were doing some project. Oh, we were putting shingles on the back of the house. And my uncle would just, he'd get up there and he'd, he'd say, oh, yeah, I know all about that. And then he would just tell him all this stuff. And my dad would get mad. And he'd say, he goes, that guy reads books, and, and just because he's read about something, he thinks he knows how to do it. Wow. Right? <laughs> and there's one thing about having knowledge. That's one thing. But putting it into practice, that's a whole other thing. And we can know things are wrong. We can know what sin is. But trying to live a life that's sinless is a whole different thing than just reading the rules over. So he addresses some of that in here. He says, these things I write to you that so you may not sin. He says, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. Notice how he says we there? He recognizes that he himself, John the Apostle, 
right? The Catholic Church would put like him on a big stained glass window and say, boy, this guy's right, you know, he's right below Christ. He recognized that he himself is a sinner. That's, that's comforting. Should be comforting all of us. He says, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. That's not a new title for Jesus. That's just describing his character. Jesus is righteous, right? He says, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins. Use that word a lot, propitiation. I don't. It's, it's not a word that we use in our culture. But back then, as people were writing to, this is a word that they understood what it meant. Um, the idea of a propitiation was what the Gentiles did when they offered a sacrifice to one of their gods. Uh, the whole idea of propitiation was, is the pleasing of a god for something you did wrong. Um, another definition I found, it was uh, averting threatened destruction by gifts. That was something that the Gentiles did. So that's what that word propitiation, that's what it kind of means. We know that Jesus was in that manner given for our sins, right? He satisfied God's need for a perfect sacrifice. And sometimes that's hard a hard thing to understand. It makes God sound really harsh that he needed a living sacrifice, a human sacrifice to pay for sin. But God needed a perfect sacrifice. And the, the thing that's interesting to note about that is God provided that sacrifice. That sacrifice was his own son. Let's look at a couple. I, I usually don't skip around a lot, you know, in the Bible. I usually like to stay in the text. But I got, I got three scriptures I just want to look at. talks about this thing. So the first one is in Leviticus 17.11, which we usually don't go to Leviticus that much because most of it deals with Jewish law. But Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 17, in verse 11, it says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, right? We all know that. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Right? That's what the animal sacrifices were for, but that's what Jesus' sacrifice was for as well. The problem with the animal sacrifices of war is the animals were sinless, but it was just because they didn't know any better. They don't have a conscience. So they couldn't be a very good sacrifice. They were sinless, but it was just because they were dumb. Jesus was sinless, and, and he knew all about the wrong things to do and the right things to do. And he lived perfectly, and that's why he was a perfect sacrifice. Another verse to look at will be in Romans chapter 5. Romans 5 and verse 10. You probably already covered this in your Sunday morning Bible class. Romans 5 and 10 says, For if we were in enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received the reconciliation. The idea of that is, is that, you know, Jesus reconciled us back, that he redeemed us back to God. And he did that by paying a price, right? His, his life on the cross was that price he paid. Another scripture that says something similar is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 18. It says here, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. 
know, this idea that God God required a sacrifice and he provided the sacrifice so that we could be brought back into God's family. As we said before, John mentions in chapter 1 that God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. Well, he can't have anything to do with sin. And that puts us in a rough spot, right? Because all of us are sinners. There's no nobody that's perfect. Nobody has lived a sinless life. Once we realize what's right and what's wrong, we're going to start doing the wrong. I don't know why, but we do. Right? Have you ever committed a sin, said something wrong, done something you shouldn't do, and, you, and later on you go, why did I do that? Or you said something, and like a second later you go, why did I just say that? That's, what he's, that's, that's, how, that's how it works. He says, and he himself is a propitiation for our sins. He, he paid for it. He took it on himself. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Sometimes, you know, we forget that Christ didn't die for just Christians. Right? I, I think we, we always, we always kind of have that in our back. Jesus died for me. But he also died for the world. He died for all people so that it, everybody could be reconciled back to him. Now, some choose not to. Most choose not to. But he died for the sins of the world. Let's go into verse 3. We'll, uh, I think we'll read to verse 6. He says, Now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and a truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word... Truly, the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Kind of sums up the first, in, the, in verse 3, sums up the whole thing. He says, by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Um, I don't watch sports. Like I, I'm just not a sports person, but I know I know two football teams. I know the Browns, and I know the the uh, what's the Pittsburgh team called? The Steelers. Yeah, the Browns and the Steelers, right? So, let's say you had a fella on the Browns who, when he got to football, he ran it into the Steelers and whatever the goal thing is, and he scored a point for the Steelers. We'd have to say. That guy's playing for the Steelers. He ain't playing for the Browns. We know by his actions who he's playing for. And Christians are the same way, right? We can notice the actions of a Christian, and we can know what team they're on. And if, if we're doing what we ought to be doing, people are going to see that. They're going to see that in the way we live our life, right? We know that we know him if we keep his commandments, He's, he who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar. Well, that's tough. Disobedience is lying about knowledge of Christ, right? Whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. We know we are in him. He who abides in him ought himself to also walk just as he walked. If we're, if we're saying that we're a Christian, we ought to act like it, right? I think that's what he's getting at. And, and probably some of these people he, were, he was talking to were having troubles with that. And <clears throat> that happens today, too. You know, there's, there's people that proclaim that they're Christians, but they're not, they're not living a Christian life. They're doing things they ought not to be doing. And uh, most people are liars. It is what it is. Verse 7, this, this is complicated. Verse 7 and 8, very complicated here. It says, Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment, which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you. Boy, that sounds like a conflict. Which, which thing is true in him and in you? Because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Hard to understand that. Let me see if I can break it. Let me break it down to you the way that I understand it. I'm not saying that this is the way it 
the, the writer may meant it. So, and if I'm wrong, feel free to say, no, Dave, you're wrong on this, you know, because that would help me. First thing he says here, he says, brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment. I think what he's talking about is, is in this context of the things he just talked about, about this idea of if you're going to say you're of God, that you would follow his commandments. That's an old commandment, right? The Jews had to follow God's commandments. I think that's what he's talking about there. I write to you no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. you got to follow God's commandments. I think that's what he meant. Now, the second verse here, I think, is a new thought. He says, again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you. And what I want to do is, now we want to know what this new commandment is. He talks about it here in the next verses, but if we go over to the Gospel of John in chapter 13, and we're going to find out what the new commandment is. So if we go into his Gospel, John chapter 13, And it's a verse 34. And it says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, and you also love one another. That's the new commandment, right? That's not one of the Ten Commandments, is it? No. So that's the new commandment. So... And the reason I say that's what it is, is as we read the next verses, you're gonna, that's all going to make sense. He says, again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you. And he's talking about love. Because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Verse 9, he says, he who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. That person is not following the new commandment, which you're supposed to do what to your brother? Love him. Right? He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness, and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. The new commandment that we love one another, the old commandment that we follow God's commandments, that's really everything you need to know to be a Christian. Right. There's there's another place, and I, I don't have this scripture written down where where Jesus asks, asks what's the greatest commandment, and it's the and the and the guy answers and says to love your the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. Right. And Jesus goes, and the second commandment is just like it: love your neighbor as yourself. If you love God, you're following His commandments. And you love your neighbor, you're, you're, you're showing love to those around you, those you come in contact with. John's saying the exact same thing. He says there's an old commandment. You got you to gotta follow what God tells you to do. And people are going to see that by the way you're living your life. And then there's a new commandment, but you got to love your brothers and your sisters and those around you. It's really none of this stuff is actually new. It's the same same stuff he said before. He's just saying it a little bit different way. The last thing I want to look at tonight is the last uh, one, two, three, three verses here, where he talks about different spiritual states. And the idea of this is, um, you know, just with, with anything else in life, there are people who are beginners there are people that are kind of at the midway point, and there are people that are old timers, that are experts. And he's giving some encouragement to these different groups. And this is where, when he uses little children, my belief is, is that he's talking about those that are, that are, uh, young in the faith. And when he uses, uh, young men, he's talking about somebody who's kind of in the middle end point. And when he uses fathers, he's talking about some old timers. And as I look around here, we got a few of those, right? 
There's a couple of white beards in here. He says, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. That's something that should encourage all of us, but certainly would encourage a young Christian. I think a lot of times when, when you um, when you first become a Christian, your past life is pretty fresh to you, right? You were just doing things that were wrong, and now you're doing things that are right. you got to rejoice in the fact that you've been forgiven all of them things. Second, he writes to the old timer, he said, write to you fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. There's a an amount of knowledge that somebody gains for themselves if they've been a Christian for a long time. And it's not knowledge just I read it in a book, like I was talking about my uncle. It's knowledge that's been read and then put into practice. And that's kind of knowledge that, you know, it takes years to accumulate. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. He's encouraging them. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. It seems like um, there's a certain period in our lives where certain types of sins are harder to resist, right? Usually between uh, the ages of, uh, you know, 16 and 42, right? <laughs> if I was to look at my own life as an example, that's a time where there are certain kinds of sins that are harder to deal with. But he's telling them to be strong. He says, he says you've overcome their wicked one. Then he writes to the children again. I write to you, to little children, because you have known the Father. Right? He's encouraging them. I've written you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you young men because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. That's all I have for this evening. And I would encourage you this week, you get time, read through John's epistles. I, I really, I really enjoy reading John's writings. And uh, he, I don't know, a, I don't know a good way to put this, but he, he seems to, he seems to understand what we go through. He understands the, the temptations that people go through. And, and he can identify with them, and he, he's encouraging. Um, he has a different, of like, if you, if you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, those are coming from one, like, a similar perspective. But then you read the Gospel of John, and you're like, oh, this guy is coming at it from a little bit different angle than the others were. And, and his Gospels are the same way. You know, Paul, Paul when Paul writes his epistles, he's more like, this, 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 and this. John's more, I guess, gentle in his approach, and 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 we need that. We need we need to get we need to get our head shooken up too. Sometimes, you know, that's why I think all of these different things are, are written down for us. But uh, it's definitely worth your time to to read through these things. And, and John's letters are very encouraging to read. If there's one among us this evening who has not put on Christ, and I, I know everybody in this room, and I don't know of a person in this room that has not been baptized. But if there were, we, we would have a baptismal back here. But I would just say, you know, if, if, you're, if you're struggling with something and you, you need prayers, uh, you know, let Jim or Eldred know. Let Rick or Dan or one of the deacons know. Um, we're here for each other. So if anybody has a need, we ask you to come forward while we stand up, always.